Introduction to Lock-Free Programming. My name is Tony Vineard. Um, this is, I, I went to the first BoostCon as, a, as an attendee. This is the first time I've talked at BoostCon. Um, and let's just jump right in. We all know this quote, premature optimization, root of all evil. I don't know if anyone knows where it came from because Knuth wrote about it. And then when asked, he said that Hoare was the guy he got it from. And then Hoare said, no, no, I got it from Dijkstra. And Dijkstra's like, no, it's not my... Like, they, they, don't, they just go around in circles about you know, whose right. quote this was. But... Um, <laughs> yeah. Rubber glass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's... Um, and why are we talking about premature optimization? We'll get to. And this one I'm f more certain about because I because I worked at Adobe and Stepanov was at Adobe. Um, what 90 percent programmers need to know is not how to build components, but how to use them. Which is why we all love Boost so much, is because we all use it instead of only a few of us write it, right? And the basic idea here is. Um, we shouldn't be in this big room. We should be in the small room. There should be about eight people there, right? We shouldn't all be doing lock-free programming. Lock-free programming is for that one percent of programmers who write a library and then we just all use it, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the other the other thing is all about testing, and and we should all learn about testing, right? We should all be over there. I'd like to be learning about testing. Um, and 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 lock-free programming is all about optimization, so keep in mind uh, premature optimizations. And another quote for you from most people that have got into lock-free programming. Lock-free programming is hard. Oh, no, 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 you know, it's not that hard. Don't you? you start learning it a little bit and it's not that hard, and then you learn some more, it's like, lock-free programming is hard. <laughs> and um, another quote, use locks. Just, that's the quote from me, use locks. That's, that's the end of the talk. Go. <laughs> um, and lastly, another reason you shouldn't be here, I'm not an expert in this stuff. Um, I was worried when Michael Wong was standing up here and he was pointing to me. It's like, no, 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 I, I point to him. And I'm not an expert either. Yeah, like, well, and, and if someone had told me that the keynote was going to be by uh, Hurley He, who, who is an expert, he, he coined the term lock free, I wouldn't even showed up. I was just like, <laughs> why am I talking about this when he's hanging out, right? So, um, and speaking of definition of lock-free programming, I'm going to skip the usual definition and go to an alternative definition, and we'll get to the real one later. Um, your typical lock, you've got, you, I'm using like a boost scope lock where it locks a mutex and unlocks it when it goes out of scope, and you do some stuff inside the lock, and that's, that's how we program, right? And the question is, how long should you hold on to that lock? And we all know it's like, well, don't do anything you don't have to inside that because we don't want to hold locks very long. We want to make them very small. So what's the limit if as we, let's do some calculus. Like what, let's take some min-max, take the limit of the size of the lock as it approaches infinity and as it approaches zero. Because I'm a math guy, so I do calculus. So the limit of something P, whatever that means, as your lock size approaches infinity is you have a sequential program, you got one big giant lock around it, right? You're not doing any threading at all. So the great thing is you have no deadlocks because you've got one. You lock the beginning of your program and you you let it go at the end of your program. You have no deadlocks. You have no live lock. Hardly any logic errors. Very simple, and you're only using one CPU basically, and your real poor use of CPUs. The other side, and this is the whole point of this, is that as you get your lock size smaller and smaller and smaller, hey, can I get my lock down to like one instruction? Like, I, I just, there's just one instruction I need to do inside my lock. If I can get it that small, well basically you can get it down to zero because you can get rid of the lock then. And that's what lock-free is. It's all about getting that size of that lock down to the point where it can just disappear. And so in my head, lock-free programming is the limit of your lock size as it approaches zero. And the cool thing about that is there's also no dead locks because you have no locks anymore, right? And you still have the chance of live locks. Um, and you have really good use of resources, and you maximize logic errors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and the uh, other interesting thing about this whole thing is that on our one side, at locks as big as they can be, we have no deadlocks. And when we make our locks as small as possible, we have no deadlocks. So there's no deadlocks. Except in this middle case where we all live, right? This, this is a very precise, I drew this with, a pencil, basically. Um, most of the code lives in the middle, where we got these medium-sized locks, and we have deadlocks all over the place. 
And, and you know, once you, it gets worse and worse as the locks get smaller and you give lots of them all over the place until you get to lock free and suddenly you hit zero again. Um, and that's, that's, this was actually, this slide I just made last night, it was at the end of my thing and I just threw it at the front here and you can for now forget about that. But that's kind of how I think of lock free is shrinking those locks. Um, this is a punchline and got my, got my, my jokes in, in reverse. We'll get to the why that's a punchline later. So what's wrong with this code? You know, you're doing a code review and you saw someone's dividing by B and you're like, oh no, that's okay, they're checking for zero. There's no big problems here, very good, they're, they're doing, they'll do some kind of memory or um, error checking, don't worry about what that is yet. So what's wrong with this code if it's a multi-threaded program? It's hard to tell, but you know, where's this B coming from? Is this B global? Is it being changed by another thread? What's going on here? If this is a multi-threaded program, uh, suddenly you check for B, B turns into zero, you crash. Because there's no locks, someone's changing B on you. So what's wrong with this code in a multi-thread program? Same th kind of idea, we're checking for B. B might change right after we've checked it. And, and the important part here is we're not using B after we checked it. You know, it's not very interesting, we just set X to 10 for some reason. And it's kind of an odd thing because, well, what if like right after I checked B, it's not zero anymore? It's like, well, I don't care. I took a snapshot of B and it was zero. Maybe that's all I care about right now, right? So it's still a bit odd and it's very spurious as to whether this code's gonna do something or not, but at least it's not gonna crash on you. So let's take that idea though and do this. It's like, we'll read B into a local temporary and then we can check it and then we can divide and we won't crash anymore, right? And let's see what my next slide is. This is a fundamental difference when you start doing lock-free programming. All our lives when we've been programming, since we were babies, <laughs> we check something, we go, oh, is B zero? No, B's not zero. Okay, for the rest of this if statement, B's not zero. It's like, throw that idea out the door, right? You check something, the next line of code, it's not zero anymore. And it seems somewhat obvious when you stop and think about it. It's like, oh yeah, someone else might be changing. Another thread's changing B on me. But the more code you do, and you go through lock-free code, I've been doing lock-free programming for like five years now, this is where the bugs come. It's like, oh yeah, I thought I could have assumed that this thing, the state didn't change on me, and you know, the rug got pulled under my, out from under me. Happens all, all the time, so try to burn this into your head, the difference between these two things, because that's, what we're gonna to need to do with lock free programming. And the whole point of my joke that I forgot about, when you're in a car traveling with the kids and they're like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you say, no, we're not there. Are we there yet? Are we there now? It's like, why do they keep asking me, right? Well, they keep asking you because the last time they ask, it's changed, maybe we're there now, <laughs> right? So your kids, when they're three years old, are great for lock-free programming, right? It's like, are we there yet? I, I'll just keep asking until, you know. And so, as a dad, what you should do is, are we there yet? No, we're here, because that's what happens in lock-free programming. You check, are we there yet? You say, no, and right after that, you're here, right? It changes right after you ask. That's the worst time your state's gonna change. So, next time your kids ask, say, are we there yet, are we there yet? No, yeah, we're here. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so this is some code, the basics of some code that I wrote 15 years ago in a device driver. It wasn't threaded code, but it was a device driver, so you're getting called at interrupt time and stuff. Didn't realize at first I was being called at interrupt time um, because I had this beta board that had no documentation and stuff. And so it's calling me and, and things weren't working out right. It was like, what's going on here? My variables suddenly are changing on me. What? I didn't know what was happening. And then it finally dawned on me, I'm getting... I'm getting called and then halfway through my code, I'm getting called again. I'm getting re-entrant. So I thought, okay, is that what's really going on? I did this check, I was like, okay, I'll check. If I'm not inside yet, I got the static inside here. I'll set it to true and then I'll do my stuff. And if I come in again and I see if I'm already in here, well then I'll, I'll put up my print statement and say, yeah, okay. And this was just debugging. I was like, I didn't have any idea what was going on. And, and then, so I ran this and, and I was like, yes, that's what's going on, it's, it's re-entrant. And then I ran it some more just to verify, and I was like, no, sometimes it's still screwing up. It's like, it's, it's like some, I'm still, it's still getting in somewhere. And it's like, 
you know, what's going on? Where's this code getting in? And it's getting in right there. I checked for, you know, are we there yet? I checked for a, a state, and then I assumed that that state was going to last. And I just needed it to last between two lines of code. They're just like, just don't call me between the check and then I set. <laughs> and and you know, this was like, I, I was like a few years out of university. I had no idea what was going on. I was I'd never written a device driver before. And I didn't know uh, the thing was calling me in, at interrupt time, and which is scary because... I mean, the real problem is, why am I taking so much time at interrupt time? If you ever, ever write device drivers, it's like, you, you don't do hardly anything during an interrupt. I was obviously doing so much that it stopped waiting for me and started calling me again. So we need to close that little gap, right, between I want to check and then I want to set something. And in my case, I went and asked the resident uh, low-level programmer who did know how to write device drivers. And he said, oh, there's this thing called Exchange. And this was on... Uh, Intel environment, but whatever. Um, and he said, exchange this is this magic thing, and you set the value, and it tells you what the old value was. And nothing can get in between. There's no gap anymore. It's atomic. Right? And that's by far the important part. It's atomic. So, in, so what I did in my case is like, I'll set it to one. I'll set inside to one, because I know, well, I'm here. It must be one. It might have already been one, but the case that I'm curious about, well, when I set it to one, was it zero just before I did it? And exchange is nice enough to return what the old value was, right? So that little thing there says, <coughs> inside it's one, was it zero? Yes, it was zero. Okay, I'm the guy who set it to one, and, and now I must be the first one here. If I set it to one and it came back one, it's like, oh, I just set it to one again. Someone else had already set it. But the important part is when I set it first, right? And, um, Sorry, but, uh, doesn't this change the semantic a little bit because you do it a right operation every time instead of doing it once? Yes. Um. Yes. There's, yeah, I, I'll, I think I do have a tiny slide about that somewhere, but, you know, we'll start small. Um, uh, the, the, the only thing I was going to say, it's called exchange because, like, on Intel, you put the, what you want to set in a register, and then you say, this is what I want to exchange, and it goes And it, the old value's in the register, the new value's in the memory location. You know, at the C++ level, why is it called exchange it, or four letters? Um, doesn't make much sense, but that's what it is. So, exchange is great. Um, you can set something and see what it was. But that's all you can do with it, right? Um, and we'll see that there's this other thing called CAS, and it's like your best friend forever. That's what <laughs> so here's, you know, the other day I was trying to write this code, you know, and all I wanted to do was to count. I just, you know, how hard could that be to count? Anyhow. Um, so I had two threads, and I want to count. And they both want to count up to 100, and the result should be 200, because they both count to 100. But there's two threads. Um, Obviously, I'm not very good at refactoring my code because those two functions are exactly the same. <laughs> and the question is, what's the result? Is it going to be 200? What, no. What's the chances it's going to be 200? It's like, probably not. Probably not going to be 200. If you have a single processor machine, maybe, even then, probably not 200. So why isn't it 200? Because we have to take a look at what count does. Count is really count equals count plus one. That's not too exciting. But this is really like three operations at least, right? We have to read that memory address of count, put it into a register, increment the register, and then write it back out. So it's like read, modify, write, three steps in the process. Um, now, remember, I forgot to say read between the lines and the other stuff, but you know, that idea of that gap there between I set a thing and then I check, or check it and then I set it, you have to read between the lines as to what can happen. And so what we thought was a one-line statement is actually a three-line statement, and we have to read between the lines and think, has anything changed? Can I be guaranteed that, let's see what my next slide says, nope. Can I be guaranteed that the state of count changed between when I read it and then when I go to set it? And right now we can't. And obviously this code, same code, we now, if we look at count being a three-line statement, Things, each, each thread can interfere with the other thread trying to increment. So, uh, 
getting back in prayers. This right, uh, how, how, sh how can we be sure this actually is a single statement that you state? Can we be sure that this, uh, if we implement, uh, execute this new right memory in parallel, what's going to happen? Is this well, okay, just that single line. Uh, Got to use my laser. This one line here, even that, we don't know in theory whether it's a bunch of instructions. But basically, let's say that's, that's atomic, right? It's, it's one variable. You know, if it's not aligned or something on memory, it's not atomic. But for now, let's not worry about that point. I'm more worried about the fact that there's three lines of code there. Um, but yeah, that, if that's not atomic, then even that write could be multiple lines of code. Yes? I was just going to say, it might be even worse, that write memory might not even be that at all. Yeah, the, for, it could be very easily that, you know, the, that's that no it's... That's point, so it should just be in register. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. We'll get to that. The compiler will change that, that entire function to count equal 100. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to write this all on assembly. <laughs> um, so this is the, before we get to it, how to solve this problem, this was an interesting question that was right up there on comp programming threads. A guy had this sort of situation, he's incrementing this count, and I think he was using it for, uh, he just needed a unique number. He's like, I don't care if it's the very next number, I just need a different number than last time. So, you know, and all these threads were hitting the same increment, and he's like, at least it's always increasing, right? Like. I, you know, I don't care if I get to 200, as long as it's always going up. And um, first of all, premature optimization. Why was this guy doing this, right? Why, like, just put a lock on this stupid thing. Don't, don't try to, oh, I, I, I can get away with not locking that, that increment. Use locks. Anyhow, I had to put this, it was even bigger, big long thing in comp programming threads, as to this is exactly line for line what happened. But basically, I can tr try to do my miming now. You know, the one thread's going one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight. And then, you know, this thread reads eight, this thread reads eight, and this thread goes, oh, nine, ten, eleven, and this guy goes, nine, you know, and this guy goes, N not, what, nine? <laughs> ten, eleven. It's like, he went from eleven down to nine. And that was, you know, and that was just surprising, right? And we had to, a bunch of people had to, you know, gang up on someone on comp programming threads and say, no, really, you can't do this. Put a lock on the darn thing. Um, so, back to this problem. It's like, we read our thing, we incremented it locally, and we just want to know, can we write it? Can, is it okay now? Has it changed behind our back? Did the other thread mess me up? So, you know, let's just put a check. We'll just check. Is it the same as it used to be? And if it's still the same after I've prepared my count, then I'll set it. And, and hopefully you guys all see that we haven't gotten anywhere. But, you know, we'll go even one step further and say, you know, well, if, if it wasn't the same, we'll just start over again and, and we'll try it again. And then sooner or later, our if will we'll succeed and we'll get in there, get our chance, right? So what's wrong with this code besides putting in a go-to? The go-to is so that the, from one slide to the next, it just kind of pops in there. Um, obviously the problem is the same old problem do I, do I have? Yeah. The problem is that same thing. There's a gap. We forgot that state changes behind our back even after we check it. We have to read between the lines. Remember, anything could have happened on that line of code there. And my best friend forever, there's this guy named Kaz that basically looks like this. And it does exactly what, you, what we want to do in that little if and the right there. It does the if and the right together. So it goes, if the value is what I thought it was, set it to the new value, and then return that it succeeded or tell me that you couldn't get it. So how's that any differently? Let me, let me do the flashing. It's atomic. So obviously this isn't CAS. This is what CAS looks like. But it's magically atomic. It does that in one instruction. Nothing can get in the way of doing that. And um, let's, um, how does that work? For now, it's magic, right? It's just the processor and everybody, it does it for you, magic. We won't worry about how that happens. 
So now count, which used to be a one line instruction, and then it was like a three line instruction, is now in a function with like eight, ten lines of code in it, and a loop inside of it. And this is basically how you have to add in uh, lock free programming. So we, you know, same old, same as before, we read our value in, we increment it, and then we do this magic. If it hasn't changed, set it right away for me. And if it did change, we loop back around and try again. That hopefully makes sense to everyone. That's about the, yes? Isn't, isn't, aren't these special instructions that also still a form of a lock and <coughs> expensive in their own way? Yes. This, the quick answer is yes. I'm trying to think of if I want to say that later or now. Um, yeah, they are. And yeah, I'll tell you later why they're more expensive. They're not as bad as a lock. Um, but almost. In some ways they are as bad as a lock because basically this is what a lock does. Um, but there's a few reasons why it's better. Okay, and we'll get to those. Yes? So, uh, just as a... Uh, uh just wondering, um, non-maskable interrupts, they are, um, they don't, can't... Right, no. Because that would be the other way to solve this problem, is just shut off all the interrupts and, well, you know. Yeah, except you can't shut off non-maskable yeah. interrupts. Yeah, <laughs> this is why I make, when I was doing a device driver, I was like, can I just sh stop that thing from interrupting me? It's like, no. Um, yeah, it's because it's the processor doing this for you. It's, I mean, okay. At the bottom of the thing, it's like locking cache lines and and doing this, it's telling the memory systems, look, here's the value, set it, and... and but that's, in, that's processor independent. I mean, that's, that's... Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, some processors don't even have a CAS instruction. There's this other thing called link load store conditional, which is a different way of doing it, and it's better and worse. But uh, basically, let's just imagine there's this thing called CAS. Um, and so CAS to the rescue, we atomic increment our count when we're trying to count to 200, and it works every time. Yay. Um, and what else can we do with CAS? Well, we can uh, add 5 module 17. Because, you know, everyone wants to do that. Um, the point being that the general form of this thing is the important part. We read our old value we modify and do whatever we want in here, and then we try to see if we can successfully set it. And if we don't set it, well, we just try again, right? And part of the thing is, well, how much work are you gonna do in here? Because you might be trying this again and again and again, because um, someone else is trying to do it at the same time as you, right? And we'll get to some of the problems with that, hopefully. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll explain that right now. So that whole idea of you're going to keep trying, right? It's like you go to the voting poll, to the booth, voting booth, and you want to vote for, oh, I don't know, Obama. And, you know, and you look and it's like, hey, there's 99 people voted for Obama. I'll, I'll, I'll scratch it out and make it 100. And as you're scratching it out, it's like, oh, no, there's 105 people that voted for Obama. It's like, I'll, I'll make it 106. Oh, no, no, can't make it 106. Um, if it's 106 now, I have to add one. It'll be 107. I go, oh, and you just keep trying to set, you know, but the, pro the thing is, every vote counts, right? That's the, the big thing. And, and so eventually, you know, you're going to get your vote in there and you won't lose, you know, we'll get up to 200. Um, if there's less contention, if you're voting for McCain, um, you know, you might quickly get in there. You only you have to try a few times before you get yours in there, right? Um, but the thing is, yes, you might be looping and doing this over and over again. And then this is why I have a pun. I thought polling was bad. Not voting, but polling in the sense of this kind of code. You know, someone's doing something over there, and when it's done, they'll let me know. So I'll just sit here and spin my wheels and just keep polling. This is called polling or spinning on the done variable. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are we there yet? Are we there? Um, and that's bad. Like, if I see this in a code review, I get out a big bat or something. Um, and because it's just burning the CPU up, and you know, if you have a yield in there, well at least you gave up some time slice, but you're still not doing anything useful. So the thing is, this looks kind of similar, right? It's like, on one case we're polling and we're doing nothing at all. Um, in the other case, in the, in the CAS case, we do a lot of poll, we might be doing a lot of polling and getting nothing done. Each one, we just like spin and get nothing done. So what's the difference between these two things? 
And the difference is, well, one's lock free and one isn't. So which one? Because like, I don't see locks on either one. <coughs> um, and it all comes down to what do we mean by lock free? And like I said, there's this guy, Hurley. My son, my son really loves Hurley shirts. So I keep trying to say Hurley, but it's Hurley. Um, <coughs> and he's the guy who came up with this. And this is not an exact quote or anything. But an algorithm that is lock free if at all times at least one thread is making progress, which is a kind of, how do you wrap your head around that? And the thing is, let's look at the first case, the, the, this polling case. We have our definition. It's just spinning around. This thread's doing work. So what happens if the, pro, the scheduler decides to just stop this thread for a while? Well, then this thread does nothing. It still wastes its time spinning around, but it's not gonna get anywhere. It's making no progress when the scheduler gets in the way. So it's kind of about what happens when the scheduler decides to stop some other things. This thread gets nowhere. So it's not making progress. And there's no guarantee that there's a thread making progress. So polling is not lock free and that's why we want to avoid it. Now, I've crammed in two threads, both trying to uh, make their vote count. They're both trying to add. And the reason why thread A is going to have to loop around is because someone else set this on them. Probably, you know, thread B. And the thing is, what happens if thread, thread B gets stopped by the scheduler? Well, then thread A doesn't have anyone screwing around behind their back, and thread A gets to set the value. One of these guys, you know, if the, if the scheduler stops both of them, then we well, sure nothing happens, but that's, we don't count that case. As long as one of these guys is, is, is uh, being scheduled and run, we make progress. That's the whole point of lock-free programming. And this whole idea of casing and then trying again and casing, called the CAS loop, is lock-free. And that's the exciting part of lock-free programming, is that you try and fail, but if you failed, someone else must have succeeded. And while we're at it, there's this other thing called wait-free. And wait-free is great. It means we're all making progress, not just one of us. And wait-free is also very hard, and I'm not going to talk about it. And there's this other thing called obstruction free that I read about on Sunday. <laughs> and it's the same guy, keeps coming back with all these things. And it's sort of uh, loosening this idea of do we just keep trying and failing? Can we somehow hope that, you know, the, the idea, the, the, the thing we want is that if this doesn't get interrupted, it passes. So obstruction three is, you know, if I was running in isolation, I would, I would you know, make some progress. And it really doesn't make much sense to me because I'm not an expert, right? I, I never heard the word obstruction free until two days ago when I was trying to find quotes for lock free. Um, and like I said at the beginning, I'm not an expert on all this stuff, so I'm not gonna talk about obstruction free either. Um, so to put these in a better order, weight free is like the best. Everybody's making progress. Lock free is a little, you know, okay, well, we're not all making progress, but at least one guy's making progress. And obstruction free is even looser. Um, we might not, I, don't, I can't even explain it, but all lock free things are obstruction free. All weight three things are lock free. So it's lock free is in between these. This is the, the most loose. But the, the idea, general idea here is that if you release, loosen some of the constraints and say, okay, it's not lock free, you can actually get better performance when you just say, okay, I don't really care. It, um, how do I explain that? I'm not going to explain it because I'm not an expert on it. I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. While we're, yeah? Um, I am. Good. I'm, I'm the Moyer of Hill, the Chanko of the Moyer. So if you want me to explain that a little better, I will. Or if you want to just skip it, that's fine too. I'd like to know later. Okay. I'd like to know that I didn't make a glaring mistake in that. Did, did I at least get the order right? That's yeah. <laughs> um, and while we're talking about this uh, guy polling, just mention priority inversion is when, you know, what happens if this thread A was at a higher priority than this thread B? And we, like, maybe we only have one CPU. Then this thread A will just run forever and never give up, depending on your scheduler, might never give up time to this and will just die in here waiting for nothing to happen. Um, and that's called priority inversion whenever you have a high priority thread that is waiting on a low priority thread. And um, 
lock free programming. If one of these is high priority, one's low priority, we don't care. One of them makes progress. We don't have to worry about priority inversion, at least for the most part. Now I'm all worried that there's experts in the audience. Um, and one little point, spinning isn't always bad. There's this thing called a spin lock where we'll just check this lock over and over again, um, waiting for it to become free. And when it becomes free, we hop out, we use it. And then when we're done, we unlock it. And yeah, that's spinning and it's bad. But if you know that you only got a couple instructions to do, it's a kind of a cheap way to write a lock. Just thought I'd mention it. Is there a legal case to, an usual case to use spin lock and user space? Um, I just read uh, a thread on comp programming threads by, I think, David Swartz, who's like one of the guys always there giving the right answers. And he has this whole thing of, you know, how many, like, how much time, is it, is it less than 15% of your time? He's got like 10 conditions on when spin locks are okay and when they're not. Um, go look it up. I, it, they're usually bad, basically. Um, someone was mentioning about those, you know, we're writing all the time. This is called sort of a test and test and set. If we think this lock's going to be um, true anyhow, don't even bother doing the exchange. And only when this is false, it's like, oh, it was false a second ago? Is it still false and can I set it to one? So we avoid, because yes, this is more costly than that. So that's just a little optimization of uh, naked, naked reads, that's what I call that, are faster than, than that, but they're also less useful. That somehow looks like a double check. The, the, yeah, yeah, it does. The reason it's not double check is because once this, once this passes, we don't just jump out, we still do this. So it's a test followed by actually just a blatant set, there's no test in the second part. Actually. Well, this returns, this returns false, yeah. right? We're looking for this to return false so that we can get out. If this returns true, we stay here. So when this is false and then we set this and it returns false, then we can go out, yeah, right? So that means it was, the lock was free for a second and not only was it free for a second, it was still free when we managed to set it. And we hop out. So, little tricks you can do. The difference between that and that is actually pretty significant if you're spinning a lot. So, let's get started. And what I mean by started is initialization. Um, assuming you were all at Michael's talk, and he was talking, you know, every now and then he'd say things about why uh, all the new atomic op, uh, items in the coming language have like static initialization and they don't have constructors and all these kind of things. One of the reasons for that constraint is a little problem like this. And to protect the guilty, um, I won't say where I saw this, but this is almost exactly other than this function name. This is code that I saw once, and this is actually the code that started me down the path of lock-free programming. I'm looking for, through some code. I don't, I don't even know if I was looking for a bug. I just happened across this code that has this critical section because this is obviously important. I want to put a protection around it. And then this critical section has to be static because it has to be shared across all the threads, right? And then I was like, well, wait a second. When does this, this thing has, this was under Windows, so this critical section sat on top of the Windows critical section, which has an init function. It, 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 so this has a non-trivial constructor hiding behind here. And I was like, well, when's this constructor get called? And, and shouldn't I put a lock around this constructor? Yeah. And basically this, this constructor gets called first time into the function, right? And if two threads are coming into this function for the first time at the same time, well, who gets to call in it? Well, on most compilers, some GCC you can set a flag for how to handle this, but on most compilers it sets a little Boolean saying, has this been init yet? And then it, I don't know if I've got, no. Um, we can imagine, because I've shown 10 examples of, has it been init yet? Okay, well I can just come in and do this. Am I the first guy here? Is anyone in here yet? Same problem happens on trying to construct this, call the uh, constructor here. And I thought it was very ironic because, well this isn't just, you know, some object that 
Do I have to worry about threads? It's like, it's a critical section. Obviously, the guy was concerned about threads here because that's why that's here. And this thing is com completely broken in a threaded <coughs> environment. And, and there's people in here, I almost guarantee, that ran this code. This is just shipped out the door, leave the names nameless, but you, it's you know, enough, popular enough software that you ran this code. Luckily, what happens often is that this happens really early in the program, so the first time there was no threads. You know, we fixed it later. Oh, I don't know. I, I didn't compile any of this. So I typed it out. I mean, that, that's a function. That's a function. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Um, Vexing parse almost. C++ OX actually has a very interesting feature, and I didn't implement it in any compiler I'm aware of. Um, but um, Google contributed an algorithm to the standard that actually allows thread-safe static initialization. I think it was... Larry. Burroughs. Mike Burroughs. Yeah, Mike Burroughs. Mike Burroughs. Um, and I call it the magic statics <laughs> algorithm. Um, I was actually surprised it's even possible. Yes, but I've read it. Without any locks or anything. I thought that TCC already implemented like, uh, some kind of thread safety. Well, there's different ways of handling this. Some of them just put one big global lock. Hey, use locks. Um, just put a big giant lock on every, like, all static share one big lock, which is scary, you know, if they're interleaving with each other. Or you can have locks for each one. And Yeah, there's lots of problems with it. Um, Google has a really nice solution for it. Uh, I'll kind of talk about some of that. So... <laughs> The problem, you know, the solution to this would be to use locks, except for, well, I can't use locks because that's what I was trying to initialize. So instead of using locks, why don't we use boost? Because remember that first quote from Stepanov was, most programmers don't need to know how to write libraries, just use them. So just use boost. And what would boost do for me? Well, I would use this boost call once thing. So if we can imagine, I didn't want to show like what this code would really have to look like, but just kind of imagine. Uh, if this had like no constructor and it was just, a pod, and we could call this, we'd like to call its constructor, its initializer, once, even in the presence of threads, so we use this thing called call once from boost, um, and this flag keeps track of whether it's been called before, and it'll call the init once, and happily we can go along our way. Um, and this thing doesn't have the same problem as that, because it's not uh, a constructor, this is just like a a pod and this is probably just zero kind of thing. So this, there's no guarantee actually even in the language today that this basically happens at l link and load time. There's no guarantee. The compiler could still do this first time in, but this is probably going to happen when your program's loaded up because it's just static data, right? Technically it's not valid C++, that's why. But we can imagine. The real solution to this is to take all this stuff and put it outside the function, right? Because then you know it, it's, it's set at, at program startup. In, in my case, um, this was inside a template, and it was hard to pull that stuff out of a template, um, so we had to do it some other way. Um, and this was kind of, I had a fork in the road. So like I said, that whole thing about this static critical section someone was trying to use was what started me on block-free programming. And then I went into how does call once work and that same idea of how does this Google paper work. And I could spend the rest of the day talking about call once and just digging into how do you write a really good call once, and I've written about five of them. Um, but then there's this other problem that everyone's heard about called double check locking. And I went to double check locking. As much as I love call once. So double check locking um, deals with singletons, right? You, typically. Typically it's because you want to uh, initialize a singleton, but you want to do it lazily. I don't want to initialize it right now. I'll initialize it the first time it's used. And singletons are just uh, fancy globals. Globals are bad. Singletons are bad. Use locks. Macros are evil. <laughs> I'm overgeneralizing. So, you know, I, this has nothing to do with my talk. Um, but I just want to say, you know, I'm going to talk about singletons. I don't really like them very much, but we have them. I think they're way overused, but anyhow. So here's uh, double check locking singleton. Um, we've got this uh, singleton object that's really expensive to init, so we don't want to init it all the time. Maybe no one will ever use it. Um, another thing I worked on, another program that you've all run, 
had about a thousand statics in it and it started up crazily slow and they wanted to start doing this and then they knew there was problems and and I was working on this stuff and the guy's like when you get a solution can you tell me because we've got a thousand singletons I was, it, was, it was acrobat <laughs> <laughs> He maybe is exaggerating, but it was, he, you know, why does Acrobat load so slowly? Um, anyhow. Um, so the thing, that's, there's, that's the reason why you want to not initialize everything right away if you can avoid it. So we have this magic thing called this double check locking where, has anyone initialized this yet? No. And so the weird thing is we're going to now use a lock. We didn't use a lock right away, but now we're going to use a lock because, you know, locks are expensive. And whoever wrote this code must have been listening to the other talks earlier. He knows that it's not just safe to check done yet. He has to check it again because sit between here and here, maybe it changed, right? We just learned that. But now I got a lock, so now I know it won't change. I'll check it again. This is why it's called double check locking. And now I'm safe to build my singleton up, let everyone know it's done, unlock, and leave. And, you know, this is just the core of a lazy init singleton. If you want a real singleton that has all this stuff built in and, you know, first time used, it just magically does all this. You can look up Myers Effective C++, Alexandrescu's Loki library, or a bunch of places where this is all wrapped into C++. Um, so the guy used locks, right? Here's our lock. We close the gap where no one can get in when I check done yet. Close the gap. And he prematurely optimized again, right? It's like, why is he doing this double check? Because he's worried about this lock being really expensive. Well, it's kind of expensive, but it's really important. We need a lock. And as it turns out, a lock that no one else has is not that expensive. It's basically that CAS back there. It's, if no one else has got the lock, it's one instruction to see, okay, now it's mine. A lock takes a little more work if someone else already has it, but that's exactly what you wanted. It's like, oh, someone else already got it. I'm just waiting anyhow. Who cares how long it takes me to wait? Um, so this is very much premature optimization because just use the lock. Right? Well, normally, mutexes have a bigger overhead because usually they have to be implemented in the operating system. There has to be a wait queue and so forth. So it's not necessarily yes. very simple. That is all true. But for the vast majority of mutex implementations, the check to see, does anyone own this? And I'm the first guy here. If it's non, no contention, <coughs> one instruction is all that's needed. It's the second and third guys who come in who see that the flag has already been set, and they're like, oh, I have to wait. Now I have to go into the kernel, add myself to the wait list, blah, blah, blah. The first guy in, um, Windows critical sections work that way. Linux few, te few texts work that way. That's the way. They all happen in the user space? Yeah. The, the if, if there's no contention. It takes around 1,000 cycles. Uh, so we used locks, but then he premature optimized. Um, so I think that's just the same code again. And the question now is, what's wrong with this code? And it's not very obvious what's wrong with this code, because it looks... An exception in that if block, and then you won't release the lock, and then you get a dead lock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all, all, the very first slide I showed with the, uh, you know, scoping of, of locks, I used the boost scope lock. All the rest of the way through this thing, I'm using just lock and unlock because I don't want to hide this. If I was writing real code, this would be, uh, you know, done in a constructor and done in the destructor to avoid um, exceptions. But I just want to make sure it's very obvious when the locks and unlocks happen. Um, so, yeah, that's not the problem at all. Um, the problem, speaking of Myers and Alexandrescu, they co totally describe this problem, and it's called the perils of double check locking. And I always think of Monty Python whenever I read that. Err, the perils of double check locking. Um, it's perilous. Oh, the peril. Um, so the answer to what's wrong with this code is memory barriers. It needs memory barriers. And in about 50 slides, we'll see where to put these memory barriers. So just keep that all code in your head for 50 slides. Um, so imagine this code run on two threads. One guy comes in, successfully does the lazy init, and then he uses this singleton and, you know, accesses it. Another guy comes in, lazy init. Well, that's already been done, so he gets the 
done yet is true, and comes in and then he crashes, because this is still null. And obviously that's impossible, right? Because like, done yet doesn't get set to here, an important pointer gets set first, we got a lock even, every, you know, this is all good. So why is that? It's totally impossible. But it happens. What's going on? First thing people always say is, aha, it's the cache. I just had to mention this because if you go on comp programming threads, they'll beat you over your head. Um, the idea being, uh, let's see, right here. The idea being that there was a done yet in here, he read that, but maybe this is still hanging out in his cache and it's still null. So, you know, I read my variable and it's still stale because it's sitting in the cache. And actually, no, that doesn't happen. There's this thing called cache coherency, and it's way too complicated to describe it, so you can look it up. But whenever something, uh, one thread sets that important pointer in its cache, it tells all the other processors, hey, your value's invalid now. Don't, don't be using it. And, and there's all this communication that goes across to make sure all the caches stay coherent. As it turns out, you can think about it like this way, but you can't go on comp programming threads and say this because they'll yell at you. Because uh, that's technically not what's going on. So what is going on? So we have these two instructions and to you know, pull out the important parts of lazy and knit. He set this pointer, he set done yet, he unlocked, he used it. This guy read done yet and then tried to read the pointer and he crashed. That gets translated into this guy did a write, he wrote his done yet, this guy did a read. And then he read this, and it still crashed. And because what really happened is the compiler, or the CPU most likely, because even if you wrote this in assembler, the CPU said, you know what, I, I don't really feel like doing it in this order. Um, most likely because you know, the cache is like, well, I've already got this cache line, and, and this is closer, or I've got a couple of reads and writes together in memory over here, so I'll just do all these together. I'll get to that one later. Whatever reason it made up, it said, yeah, I, I'm just going to write done yet first. You don't care, right? And then I'll write this. And this guy over here said, I'm just going to read this first. And this one's really odd because there was an if hiding back there, right? We didn't just read done yet. We checked if it was true. And then we, re we only read this if this was true. So how could the compiler or the processor decide to read this first Basically it said, I, I don't look at ifs, I just read right past them. Because that's called speculative execution, right? So, first of all, we'll get to that. Um, is the compiler reordering instructions? Maybe. But more importantly, the CPU is reordering the, your instructions on you. And why do they get to do this? So they both have the same rule. Reorder, optimize, do whatever you want, as long as you don't screw up the program. Right? Because if your compiler started reordering things on you and your program broke, you'd be like, I really wanted to set X and then Y and this is the order this is supposed to happen. Don't screw around with me. So, yet they do. And there's the fine print. Really fine. And purposely too small to read. Assuming a single threaded program. The compiler and the processor will reorder all your stuff, ignoring threads. Now the compiler's got a really good excuse because there's no threads in C++ yet. So it can just say, I don't know what you're talking about. This is all the code that ever happens. <laughs> Away we go. The CPU, he's got no excuse. He's like, there's another CPU right beside him. Yet, he's going to reorder this anyhow, assuming a single thread program. And we'll kind of get into reasons later, but basically because most of your code is single threaded. And it's kind of a good assumption to make that, yeah, you probably don't care. I'm just going to reorder this stuff. And we'll see why it has to do that. Le right, later. So, I'm not an expert in lock free. I'm even less of an expert on how CPUs work, but I'm going to kind of hand wave on how CPUs work. Once upon a time, the CPU and the RAM were basically running at the same speed, and that was long ago, and now the speed of RAM <coughs> is way, way slower, like hundreds of times slower than your CPU. So that's why the CPU said, well, we'll get to that actually. What's the CPU to do? 
if it waits for the memory operation to complete, it's got to sit and wait for hundreds of cycles for that write to happen and for then that read to happen. And so what should a CPU do in this case? Well, it shouldn't wait. It just goes, I don't care. I'm writing that. I'm just going to keep going. I'm not going to wait for that to finish. And it's a hundred of times magnitude difference. That's why the CPU makes this big assumption that it does, because otherwise our stuff would be really slow. So it doesn't wait. And so here's kind of what a CPU maybe looks like. It's got memory, it's got a cache, it's got the CPU, and this is what it does when it writes stuff out and doesn't wait for it to get to here or to here or wherever it might be going. It just says, okay, I'm writing Z and I'm gonna write Y, I'm gonna write X, and it just throws them in this queue and it tells the memory subsystem Get around to that sooner or later. I'm not waiting for you. I can't wait for you. You're, you're hundreds of times slower than I am. So whether it really has a write queue or not, we imagine that it has this write queue. And either the CPU or the memory processor that's pulling things out can just, oh, I'd like to do X first, and then I'll do Z, and then I'll do Y. And thus, these instructions get reordered. That's what's going on. So we have two instructions, x equals 1, y equals 2. They get pushed in the queue down, so x gets pushed first, y gets pushed. And then the, the memory system says, oh, I'm going to take y out, and then I'll take x out, and the result ends up, it looks like this. They're performed out of order. I write performed because as it gets technical, what does you really mean by performed? Where did this go to memory? Did this go to the cache? Is it really finished? We'll leave those questions for now. But basically that's what happened. It went to a queue, came out the wrong way. And that's how your stuff got reordered. Um, now what about reading? Reads are a bit different, but we can imagine mostly that they're the same. So we got X, we're setting X, we're setting Y, and then we want to read Z. Well, you know, it'd be great if we reads are slow. We don't want to wait. We have to kind of, our, a lot of our code has to wait for the read. We can't do anything until we know what the value was. But we don't want to wait for hundreds of cycles. So what we do is we look ahead, and when we're way up here or way up here, we go, oh, we're going to read Z later? Okay, I'll tell the memory to start reading Z now, before I read X and Y, and I'll read Z first. Or before I set X and Y, I'll read Z first. And the other thing it does, like I mentioned, is that it'll just drive right past this if statement. and says, you know what, I might have to read Z later, so before I look at X, I'm just going to, maybe for some reason Z is more important for me to look at first. I feel like looking at Z first. I'm going to read this really early, and... Well, maybe I'll need it, maybe I won't, but I've got it. I'll have it by the time I need it, right? And the last thing the read likes to do is to look, doesn't even go down here or here for what it's reading. If you're reading Z, it's like, oh, you know what? I haven't even finished writing Z yet. So why am I going to go look for it down here? I'll just pull it right out of here because eventually I'll write it and it'll be 8. So if I read it now, well, I guess it's eight, because it's gonna be eight. And, and we're just one CPU all by ourselves, so who cares what else is going on? Nothing else is going on, we're a single thread. We imagine that we're here in isolation, so I can just read Z equals eight right out of this queue. That's an interesting case, because a lot of, like every CPU does this stuff differently, and a lot of them will say, I don't, I don't reorder reads, or I don't do this fancy thing, or maybe I don't do that. A lot of them say this stuff, but then they still do this, which ends up getting somewhat the same effect, so you gotta be careful with your CPUs. So basically, if you got read and writes, they can just, pff, and if you have no idea what order that happened. Well, wouldn't that change the behavior of the program? Uh... Yes. So, what about if I want to read Z and put it into Y? That's two operations, I read Z and I put it into Y. And then the compiler and the CPU will reorder that to the exact same thing. Because I can't reorder that one, right? That's, that would break a single processor machine. You know, They'll break your multi-threaded code, but they're not going to break your single-threaded code. So anytime code has to happen in a certain order for one thread, you're still safe. All our single-threaded programs work. And the, the CPU is smart enough to not mess with that on you. Um, in theory, a CPU could speculative, speculatively guess at the value of Z because maybe it knew what it was before and write it early or something like that. They don't do that. They don't do like speculative writing, crazy things like that. Maybe someday they will. But whatever, they'll guarantee that from the point of view of this CPU, 
everything is working. So back to our DC, uh, DCLP. It should be obvious what happened now. We program this, set a pointer, tell, it, tell everyone it's ready. Other guy checks it and then reads it. And it got completely reordered. And here's our speculative execution. We read it and then we checked if we could read it. Okay, and that's why it crashes. So the real question is, why does DCLP work? Because I've seen it. I've seen lots of code that does this, and people have used it for years, and it seems to work. And I just showed you it doesn't work, but you run a bunch of code and it seems to work. And there's a, lots of reasons why it seems to work. Singletons usually happen really early and not inside of threads, usually. The thread interleaving, you don't usually get, like, there's only like one line of code space where another thread can, can there's just that tiny little gap where another thread can get, come in and screw you up. That's very small. You don't get, like, threads back and forth, back and forth. It's like coarse grain. Here, you get some time, you get some time. So you won't get these small windows happening very often. And the other reason is Intel x86. Go ahead and write DCLP on Intel yeah. because you'll never have a problem because they don't do a lot of reordering on you. That's why we haven't seen this. Like when I first saw DCLP, I didn't believe it. I was like, this can't happen. I set my pointer, I set my done, done is true, I check done, check the pointer, how can that ever fail? And it doesn't fail because I write a lot of code on Intel machines. But it doesn't really work on other machines, even on an Intel Itanium or something like that, or a PowerPC, it won't work. Um, one little comment is that I lied when I said, imagine this happens first, and that this is all finished, and blah, blah, blah. The hard part is how to use these words that, you know, this completed, and this happened before that, and this got reordered and then got performed. So much stuff is happening, even in that write queue, you know, did X get pulled out of the queue first and then Y, or maybe they're written at the same time, right? It's like, you can hardly even tell what it mean to reorder something because things can be happening at the same time. It might get to the cache here first, it might get to memory here first, you might have separate caches and this CPU if you got like four CPUs and these two are close together and these two are close together, this guy sees one thing, this guy sees enough. Suddenly the whole idea, of, like Michael said earlier, it's like relativity. It's like, the problem is, I don't know if I have a slide for that or not. The problem is that you can't just open up your computer case and stare at the memory as it's happening and, and see, oh yeah, there, X got set, okay, now Y got set, and that, that, that. You can't see that, right? All you can see is the view from a CPU. And each CPU has a different view. It's like relativity. Everyone's got their own view of things. And suddenly you get this problem of, well, then what's it mean? Did that really finish? It's like, well, from your point of view, it was written. And from your point of view over here, that was read. But so just it's just a general comment on even some of the words I'm using are kind of wishy-washy because it gets really, really hard. And that's why you see a lot of the definitions in the standard and in other people's things that make no sense because they don't say completed, they say visible. And they, all these words that, why did they use the, what, just use simple words? Well, simple words don't make sense anymore. So, we've got this problem. Things are getting reordered. What are we gonna do about it? Well, use locks. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the other talk. There's too many people here. Um, so we'd like to prevent that. We have two memory operations, A and B, and they're, we don't know what order they're gonna happen. We'd really like to say, don't, just, just don't reorder these for me. Tell the processor, don't, stop it. And let's imagine it was a write. These were two writes, and they get put in the queue, and we'd like to say, don't reorder these. One way we could do that is like, put A in the queue, flush the queue, wait for A to finish, wait, wait hundreds of cycles, and then put B in the queue. Hey won't get reordered. Wouldn't that be great if we could just mess with the queue? What if the flush gets reordered? Well, yeah, you imagine this flush is a special, it's not a memory operation, it's a tell the write queue to do something. You can, well, no. By using the rule that says is that the program cannot be modified um, in a single threaded execution. If I take the, in the done yet, make it a member variable, and then switch it back and forth, 
it, I'm or and or incremented or something like that. I'm guaranteed that I have to put it in the memory variable. I, I mean, in the class member before. I can reuse it again, and it has to be written before I can read the value. Guaranteed. Well, well, that's just, just a good question. Let's put this done yet inside. Well, you know what? Let's get rid of this done yet. No, no I'm sorry. I'm, just, I, 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 what I'm saying is, is that if I have inside, let's say I have inside of my simpleton, I have a member uh, int uh, called well, I, I think I know what you're asking. Let me, yeah, okay. let, me, let me tell you. Let's, let's, let's look at it this way. Let's just use this pointer as our flag. Right? We construct some stuff in here, okay. and we use this as our flag, and then instead of checking done yet, we check if the pointer's there. Right? Is that what? Um, you know, because then it'd be like, well, all this stuff has got to be there, because I... No, you're missing my point. Okay. Um, I actually had a processor that... I worked on that actually had this problem, and this is how we solved it. Um, you, if you go back here, uh, go back to that first line of code, okay? This, the single, the... If you use the rule that you can't change this for single-threaded behavior, what you have to do is to make sure that done yet yep. has to be written again, or has to, it can't be modified between the first done yet and the second done yet, all the reads and all the writes and the pipelines have to be emptied and everything has to be done before that second is completed. Or the program will fail in single-threaded mode. And the, the way I suggest that that could be done is to have a temporary, you, you can't use a temporary because the temporaries get optimized out. But if I, if I have something, just a dummy variable inside of my class, call it m underscore done temp. Yeah. And then I say, m underscore done temp equals done yet after the lock and then I say m underscore done temp plus plus then what, what I've done is I've guaranteed that done yet or done yet or m underscore temp done equals done yet plus one what I have done is I've guaranteed that done yet had to have been rewritten reread yep. because otherwise it'll break in single threaded mode. Yes. Now, now I've guaranteed that done yet has actually read a second time and the caches are clear. If, uh, if you, because otherwise it'll fail. I, I'd have to see code, but I think that what that all comes down to, and maybe it depends on the processor again, you've, you, you, you've successively handled done yet, but you said nothing about this pointer. There's nothing to say that pointer could still be lagging around somewhere and not, not completed. Right, I think you're assuming sequential consistency is the problem. And you might be actually correct. Maybe the temporary should use the pointer. Yeah. So gu to guarantee that that particular pointer yeah. has... And, then, and that's why I said the problem yeah. comes then. is like, okay, now my pointer's right, but what about all the data that it points to? I have no idea that... I have no guarantee that it was written at the same time. So in, in that case where you say pointer equals new, all that stuff that happened in constructor could actually happen after the pointer. The pointer being set could be the first thing that happens. Right? You can allocate the memory, set the pointer, and then call the constructor. Right. So it gets really scary. I've, I've no, I mean, basically, I haven't, no one's seen a solution to DCLP that didn't involve memory barriers. So, um, Anyhow, we could flush this write queue. Or better yet, we could kind of just put a marker in there and tell whoever's reading the queue that pretend there was a flush in there. So. Sure, read A and read whatever else, whatever order you want, but make sure this is done before you do these. I don't care what order these are in, just make sure they're after this. This first, then those. And the same sort of idea for reads. We could, you know, no, I never did draw a picture of a read buffer because I'm not even sure there is one, but the same idea of you could, if there is a read buffer and these are all the operations, you could put a marker in there and say, don't reorder across these markers. So wouldn't that be great if the processor let us do that? Use locks. So here's, this is up here for a different reason for a change. How do locks work, right? Like we've got all this reordering going on and then, I'll, then you call lock and unlock and magically it doesn't reorder, it makes sure that code didn't get reordered outside the locks. So 
it's a little hint here that, yeah, you know, there must be some way of preventing reordering because the guys who wrote locks knew how to do this. Um, and, you know, this is it. Like, somehow this lock and unlock prevent this from getting happening here or happening here. It must happen between these two lines of code. It doesn't get reordered. There's a lock flag hiding, you know, these lo a lock flag in here that doesn't get reordered with that pointer. And how does this happen? And basically, you know, when we said the compiler had a good excuse for reordering stuff because it doesn't know what threads are, the CPU is sitting beside another CPU. And so, yeah, it knows what's going on. It can give us some help when we need it. And it, what it does is gives us these things called memory barriers. And it's nice, the, the processor gives us memory barriers because it was the processor's fault in the first place for reordering these things, so it's nice of it to let us control the reordering. <coughs> and basically now, you have a bunch of instructions, reads and writes, whatever. You say, stop right there. Between P and Q, I put a barrier. And the CPU is going to reorder these, maybe like that. And it'll reorder these ones down here, but you'll never see a line crossing the barrier. A won't get down here. It has to stop as close as it can go is there. And that's a barrier, right? That's the whole idea. Stick these things in there. Say, don't reorder across this line. So if you stop and think about it, this memory option, memory operator A could be a load, a read, or it could have been a store, a write. And same with this one. So two types of memory operations. There's actually a lot more. You could be writing to um, device I.O. and you can be doing, you know, depending on the CPU, there's all these other kinds of reads and writes and magical things. Let's just imagine we got simple load, simple store, to and from memory. We might not even have a cache. Forget about the cache. We just read and write to memory, and we say don't reorder that. So if this is a loader store, that's a loader store, we have all these options. We could have a load followed by a load, da 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 And these are the particular things we want to stop reordering. And that means we can have four different barriers. If we want to be really precise about it and just say, I'm really worried just about loads. I want to make sure this load happens before that load. Or no, 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 in this case, I'm only worried about this load in this store. So we get these barriers, each one, you know, hopefully you can figure out that, you know, prevents exactly this case from, from um, reordering. And there could be more, because there could be more operations, but there's, these are the basic four, and we'll see how these work. First one, like we've had this right queue and the right barrier. We basically want to say, don't reorder your writes. So any stores that are on this side have to stay on that side. Any stores over here have to stay over here. And basically what we're trying to tell the CPU is, I want to make sure A and B happen before C gets written. I don't care about reading X. I don't care about Y and Z. Um, you know, Z happens really early. Um, you know, some other things get reordered, but the ones in bold will never go across the line because those are stores. Um, this is an interesting one. This X has to happen before this because we're trying to set read X and put it into B. So that has to happen first. This is a read, so really it could have drifted down here, but it's forced to stay above that, right, for, for single processor constraints, right? We have to do X before we can set it to B. Um, so on one side, you're still free to move around. On the other side, you can move. Loads can go up and down. There's a load changing, um, and it's just stores that we are preventing. What do you want to do with this, right? Okay, we can keep our stores from moving around. What good is that? Well, let's say you're adding some data to a queue. We write our data. These are stores, right? We're writing our data. And then we add it to the queue. If we're going to put this in the queue and, you know, somewhere in the queue it's going to do a write and change its pointers around, well, we better make sure if this data is there that we wrote it first. That's why we put a store store barrier. It's like, make sure you wrote it before you tell anyone you wrote it. Similarly, singletons, back to the singleton problem, we set up our singleton, we do some writes. If we did some reads in here too, well, they probably we were reads for the sake of these writes. We're not worried about those. And then we say our singleton is now ready. So to solve that whole singleton problem, make sure these happen before this happens. 
and we put a store store barrier. They're both stores, that's the barrier we use. Okay? Similarly, we can prevent our reads from getting reordered. And this one's saying, I need to read X before I read Y and Z. I don't care about these other writes for some reason, just the reads. And um, we still have this single processor constraint that B has to happen before that, but it's a write this time, so it can hang out down here. Still happens before. Other things, this thing can still cross the line because it's a load. It couldn't cross before, or it's a store. It couldn't cross last time, now it can. Um, but we see X happens before Y and Z. X is read before Y and Z. Oh, they reordered, but at least they happened before X. That's all we said we were caring about. That's why we put the barrier there. And what would we do with this? Uh, magically, it's the exact opposite of the store store. We say, hey, did you put something in the queue? Is it ready? Okay, I'm going to read it. So better read ready before we read this. We don't want the processor coming along, speculatively executing. We don't want that to happen before we know it's ready. Right? We stick a barrier in there, say, do that, then do that. Or same with the singleton problem. Check if our singleton's null or done yet or whatever. Make sure we finish this, make sure this happened, and now read the singleton. If you plan to write to the singleton, you would need more because you know you don't want your writes to float up. But we're just re re about reading right now. Does that make sense? So interesting, the load load is like the mirror of the store store. For a queue, we write our data, store barriers, called a write barrier, and then we push our data, we publish it. On the other side, we check, we subscribe to that data, and then we read it with the load barriers. Singleton, same thing. Write them out, make sure the writes are finished, write out that we're ready, uh, check if it's ready, a load, make sure that's finished, and then we can use it. Same thing. The big important part about all this, one is that you're going to do this over and over again, is you're going to prepare your data, put a barrier in there, say the data is ready, check if it's ready, put a barrier, use the data. This happens locally, you know, maybe if you read the, all the data at once, then you can do the rest of the work locally. And the big part is that you mirror these all the time. If, you know, it's like, the thing that always happens is, okay, let's, say, let's talk about the singleton, right? I wrote my singleton out, I make sure this is written, and then I say it's ready. I've got them sent to memory in the right order. So why do I need to do this over here? It's like, I've put them in the right order. Singleton's ready, flag set, good, we're good. Yeah, but this guy decided, who cares how you wrote them, I'm gonna read this first and then I'm gonna read that later. All right? And we don't know which happens first, so you need both sides to put things in the right order. If only one side puts them in the right order, you've got nothing guaranteed. Um, two more barriers. Load store says these loads happen before these stores. So X must be read before C is written. Um, interesting part of this is that we're now talking to the write queue on, on the stores and the read queue. We're talking to both queues. So it's basically, whether the processor does this for real or not, it's basically flushing both those queues, waiting for both of them to finish, and then going along its way, which means this is actually even slower than the single read barrier that only had to slow down one side of the processor. Um, and then why would I want to make sure something was read before something was written? Well, it's because I'm going to use something, right? It's like, hey, do you have something ready for me to write to? Is the destination ready? Okay, make sure I read that. Now I'm going to write to the destination. <coughs> this has to happen before that. Or maybe I've used some data and then I want to say I'm done with it. Right? Make sure, all your, make sure you really are done with it before you say you're done with it. So not quite as common. Doesn't have a, doesn't have a name like a read-write barrier. It's just called load store. And store load is the last one. It says, hey, make sure you write A and B before you read Y and Z. And if you stop and think about that, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's like, write these out before I read these. Like, why? <laughs> if you let you think about that one. So, what's the use of the store load? 
basically nothing. I will try to make up a use for you because we had our load store. Let me back up a second. I said load store was useful to say you're done using something, right? Somewhat useful. I'm reading it. I'm done reading it. It's your, you know, you, you can have it now. So store load, we could use it for the sake of rudeness. I come in. Oh, oh, the, actually, I didn't have to back that. That's, that's where I just backed up three slides. That's the old slide. It's nice of me to put that there. Um, that's the, the old one. And now we're saying, hey, I'm going to use this. And now I'm going to read it. And it's rude because I didn't even check if anyone else was using it. Right? I just said, hey, I'm going to use this now. And off I go. So you can kind of think, well, maybe that would be a good use of store load. But as it turns out, it's really not very useful because you should really check this before, you know, is anyone else using it before I say I'm using it? There might be the odd case where this comes in handy, but typically not. Just, I'll just throw that slide in every now and then, just kind of. I, I should go by really fast so you don't even know that you read it. <laughs> um, but it's there because some of this is starting to look like locks, right? We had this, the load store was useful for, you know, hey, is something ready? Because I want to read it. And then the load load was, is something ready? Because I want to write it. Actually, I got those backwards, did I? Yes, I got those backwards, whatever. Um, so let's combine them anyhow and say, hey, if this is ready, I would like to read and write it. This looks a little bit like a lock, right? Like I grab a lock, and if the lock's ready for me, um, I would like to read and write. But we're not like checking if the lock's, where well, we're checking if the lock's, it's more like a try lock. If the lock's free, you know, but I'm not telling anyone that I'm going to use it, right? So it's kind of lockish, but it checks without setting. So remember our best friend forever, Kaz, here. Um, we're going to say, hey, th if this lock was zero and I set it to one and this will return true, there's, I should have mentioned earlier that there's like 57 forms of Kaz. Some of them return the old value. Some of them, um, uh, it sounds like, well, the big one is some of them change the order of the, op of the parameters. So you're reading code, you don't know which is which. Am I checking for one and setting zero, or setting zero and checking, you know, like... Anyhow, my version of CAS uh, tries to change this thing. If it was zero, I set it to one, and I'll return whether it happened or not. So, was it zero? Now it's one? It must, must be mine, right? I'm the guy who set it to one. And then I say, okay, I've done that, and I'm free to use this thing. And if I couldn't set it, well, maybe I'll do something else. You know, I'll probably like to wait, but for now, let's just say I'll do something else. So a bit more lockish because I'm now setting the flag. But Kaz did a store, right? Not just a load. It doesn't just load the variable; it writes the variable. Why do I only have load, load, and load store? Why, like, loads on this side, meaning I prevent, I keep all my loads up here, but my stores could float down. Does anyone know why I don't have stores? It's atomic. Yeah. When I wrote it, I read it. So if the, if the read is forced to be up here because of the barrier, well, so is the write. So that's all I need. Load, 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 store. And let's make this... Oh, yeah, there, there's the answer. That's why we don't need it, because it's atomic. And let's be even more... Um, Lockish, a little more revenge of the rudeness here. Return of the Kaz, revenge of the rudeness. Tr trying. Um, so we checked our lock, we grabbed it, and when we're done, um, we say we're done. Um, I'm, not, I'm trying to think of why I thought that was rude. It's not really rude, actually. It's it's. Uh, okay, I'll think about that one. Um, yeah, maybe that's a question mark. Where is the rudeness? Where is the store load, which was the rude one? Um, we got this all good. We used it, and now we say we're done. We want to make sure this lock is the last thing we do. Make sure anything we've read is done, anything we've written is done, and we're done. So is this a mirror of that? Because I would have expected to see that store load one, the missing instruction you know, somewhere in here, but I've managed to avoid it. And to make this look like a mirror, let's imagine that load load plus load store is like load and everything else. Make sure the loads are done before you do anything else. And this one is make sure everything's done before you do a store. And now it looks like a nice pretty mirror. Load before everything, everything before store. 
And in particular, check your lock, load, make sure that's done, do everything else, everything's done, clear your lock. And the best part about this is we didn't use a store load and it was the slowest barrier to use and we just avoided it completely. And the real question is that whole correlation causation, is store load the slowest barrier? You know, is that why we avoided using it? Or is it because we don't need it that the processor guys just didn't bother making it faster? Right? I don't really know, but... Well, well if you think about it, if you say something is written, it has to be completely written before it can be examined or read in any way. Yeah, but Otherwise, it violates cause any of the single problems. Sure, but the thing is, the store load is, is not just worrying about one variable, right? It's like, or any of these, it's like, I'm going to do these stores and then some other loads, right? So there's no causation on those, between those. Or um, if there is causation and I say, I'm going to do a store and then I'm going to read it back, well, for this processor, I don't care if the store completed. I know what I wrote. I don't care if, you know, I said it was 10. I know it's 10. I don't care if it really got written out as 10, right? True. true. That's, that's like the crux of the whole problem. Um, different kind of company, different kind of barrier. So all these things that I've been calling load store, load load, load, and you can go read comp programming threads and they throw this around. For the longest time, I had no idea what they were talking about until it dawned on me one day. This is all like a Spark convention. And then Intel came out with this other idea called acquire and release. And as it turns out, this is kind of what C++ is leaning on, the same idea. And like I said, how we use these words visible and performed and before and happens before and all this. There's this big giant from Microsoft, what acquire means. It means, you know, this operation completed before these other things. And I, I don't know, this makes almost no sense to me. <laughs> and, you know, it uses the word visible somewhere right there. And it comes back to the idea, we can't just open the case and look at things. So we can't say it's completed, but we can say it's visible to the other processors. That's kind of the important part. But let's just look at what um, we do with acquire instead of store loads and stuff. Acquire and release happen. It's load and store barriers happen between instructions, right? We, we load, we barrier, and then we do some more instructions. Acquire and release happen on an instruction. So it's like, I'm going to do this, make sure there's an acquire. That's this part, it's like, on the memory operation being performed, that's this operation, we want an acquire barrier. And what it says is, um, I'm not even gonna try to figure, do this either. It, we'll go to the very next slide. It means, after means after, and before means before, so. So much less than that, right? So this means if I, after this operation, anything that happens after really happened after. It didn't happen up here, it happened down here. That's what acquire means. Release means anything that happened before this happened before this. Isn't that great? It's, and which is basically why the C committee is probably one of the reasons they're going towards it. It's a lot easier to understand than the lower level load store kind of barriers, right? It's like, these really did happen bef after this and before that, which is really nice because now we've boxed this in side here. It can't escape. It can't escape from the top and it can't escape from the bottom because it wasn't just some of the operations. It was all operations, both loads and stores happen after that and before that. And that's why locks, you know, same idea. That's why locks work. We acquire on the lock do this stuff, we release, these instructions can't escape. Yes, first time for a live audience. What's the relationship between acquire, release, and load store? I should just like, uh, hopefully you can guess, but for years you have one camp of people talk about acquire, release, another camp talk about load, store, blah, 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 and I've never on the internet seen an explanation of how they relate. So here it is, live before a live audience. Um, pretty simple actually, read with acquire on this lock is like, do the read and then to stick in your two barriers to make sure everything else happens after the read. And the write with release means do the barriers first and then the write. 
So you see how it's kind of tricky, right? One does the read, then the barriers, the other does barriers, then the write. And magic, are they really equivalent? They're pretty darn close to equivalent, but they're not exactly equivalent. So, let's see why this is. Here's our lock. We got some important data that we'd like to do stuff with, read and write, and then we unlock it. And we got this other data up here, this unshared object. It's not shared across threads, so it's outside the lock, just where we'd like it to be, right? And, um, you know, if it gets, if X was used in here, then, you know, we'd have some dependencies, single processor dependencies, but maybe it's not used, maybe it's just hanging out, and this is just hanging out down here. <coughs> and the question is, can, first question is, can this happen before that, right? One's way up here on this side of the lock, one's way down here on that side of the lock. So can these happen out of order? And the second one is, can this and this one come out of order, which is even kind of farther away? And, you know, like single processor, can, can this happen? Why didn't I ask important questions about one happening down here? One can't happen there because we read it, we had to read X before we write it. Right? There's a dependency, single processor dependency there. So we're not too worried about one. We're worried about can two get put down here. And does anyone know the answer to this? Here's the great answer. Who cares? Right? You got some data, has nothing to do with this lock, and some more data. Who cares which of these things happen first or last? Right? It's it's not important. But just to let you know, let's take this code with the lock and translate it to our load store barriers. So that lock was basically, well first of all, even these lines I'm going to make loads and stores. That was a load, that was a store. The mutex lock was basically some kind of CAS operation or we wait. Don't have to worry too much about that, but let's imagine there was a CAS inside there somewhere. Then we did our barriers saying Make sure this load was done before we do anything else. This thing in the middle inside our lock was the loads and stores on shared data. <coughs> Clean, um, you know, put the other sides of our mirror locks here. Somewhere inside the mutex unlocking, we did a store, making this flag lock available for other people. And then we did our unshared stuff out here, right? So that's just the translation of, you know, mutex, what, what, goes, in, what goes on inside of mutex, right? Now, since we've broken it all out, we know we can reorder some of the stuff in these barriers. The loads have to stay up here, but what about this store? Well, that store that was up there can go way down here. And it stops there. This is the first store on the left-hand side. So a store can just drift down right through this lock and stops there and it can't go any farther. Similarly, there was, I should have done this on two like sides. Um, there was a load down here, and we can imagine, it comes up to this barrier, says, nothing to do with me, comes up to here and says, I not care about this side. Oh, a load on that side? Yeah, I can be on this side. I can be on this side, and then it stops right there. So there's that load, drifts up until it's barriered, right? There, there's the load. And, you know, that's as far as things can drift. We see that three was down here somewhere, it drifted up. Two drifted down. Even the load, the, the load of one, which was up here, has drifted underneath the CAS. Because it's still before the barrier, but it's after the CAS. And same with here, the unlock was there, and this was underneath it. Those two can get reordered, because they're both stores, but they're both before the barrier, right? So that's like maximum reordering, I hope that makes sense, of what was really going on, and now let's untranslate, put, get rid of these CAS and these barriers that were hidden inside the mutex, and now we see all our instructions got dragged into the mutex and somewhat reordered. Um, the interesting part is nothing went outside the mutex, so we got that going, going for us, which is good. That's, which is nice. Which is nice. Is that what it? Caddyshack, that's from Caddyshack, which is nice. Um, yeah, so, and the thing you got to remember about that, do you really care that these things dragged inside the lock? 
right? Probably not, as long as things don't go outside the locks. Hmm? Mike here, if you don't want to do very much inside that lock, yes. or if they're waiting for it. Yes, yet the processor decided it would be faster if it dragged it in there for some reason. And, you know, this isn't the compiler that decides, you know, maybe the compiler does some of this, but the compiler is deciding once and for all, I'm going to put this inside here. The processor, every time you run through this code, the processor might reorder it differently, right? So at this particular occasion, it decided it was fine to... And, and furthermore, was it even the processor or the memory system like, that decided these things? So we only thought of that for a single thread, right? We never really thought of a multi-threaded system overall running. No, no. I mean, that's, the magic of all this stuff is that by using barriers, the processor still only cares about itself, right? It just says, okay, I'm limited here. I can't reorder some stuff. That happens to be useful for other, other threads, but it's, I'm, I'm very egocentric, right? Egocentric processors. So you mentioned that if there was no other contenders for the lock, that you had just a single instruction, but aren't the uh, barrier instructions uh, real instructions? Yes. And ultimately, they're assembly language instructions. Yes. So I'm, I'm assuming that you get a barrier, essentially, an instruction uh, as that single line. As a yeah, you get a, you get a barrier level instruction, and it's an instruction that doesn't get reordered. Right? It's right. a real instruction. And um, it might be a barrier instruction on some processors, and in some processors they have an inquire instruction that happens on the read or write. It's like a, a modifier on your read or write. Um, I have no idea what time I'm supposed to be. What? When am I supposed to be done? I'm way over. <laughs> <laughs> you spend too much time inside the lock. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can go as long as people want to go. I don't care, but feel free to. How, how much more have you got? I, I got more. <laughs> I, um, I would least like to get through this section. What I really liked, wanted, wanted to show was how to do like a lock-free stack or something. Um, let me burn through, but feel free to just leave. Um, same idea, acquire release. The interesting part is um, things can drift even farther on require release because all it says is um, now I'm, I'm off here. All, acquire just says after means after. It doesn't say anything about what happens about before. These things before can drift down as far as they want. They just have to be blocked here. These things can drift up and they get stopped here. And you actually get more reordering on require release than you get on the load store stuff. That's all I want to say. Um, what was the question? DC LP. Maybe we'll just get to finish that. So there was the code. What was wrong with this code? Memory barriers. Let's put the barriers in. We acquire on this to make sure everything that happens. This acquire is really for the guy who comes in and finds this as being true. He wants to make sure his code that happens outside of the init really happens after. So he says, after means after, jumps out, and all this code does happen after. Um, then we come in, we do a lock, which happens to have another barrier in it. Then we do this stuff, make sure this is done, we set this flag, and we unlock, and off we go. And what's wrong with this code? Nothing, except it's too complicated. It also has four barriers in it. Barrier hiding there, and one there, one there. And an interesting one is, this does a full like store, store, load, store, whatever, right there. Yet we needed another one here. Like, couldn't we get rid of this and just rely on that? Well, isn't isn't this exactly what you think does internally? Basically, yes. And and which is why why did you bother with this when it's so complicated? Um, and and you've added more barriers than just the two. And the idea here is that this is necessary because before you unlock, if this isn't here, this can be done too early, right? These have to be ordered regardless of this lock. We don't want to see this too soon. Um, and the whole point was that was pre premature optimization and you should have used locks. And then we go back to this stepping off thing in the back of our heads. 99% of programmers don't need to know this. There's too many people in this room. What about that 1%, right? 
we got four barriers here. Do we really need four barriers here? You know, and what does the mutex do? Could we, could we cut this down? Um, how about a uh, lazy knit that has uh, two barriers for the first thread in that does all the work and only one barrier for the thread that comes in and finds it already done? Uh, it would be great if it only used a single word like the bool done yet. That turns out to be hard when you get complicated. It'd be great if it didn't have a mutex sitting around for the rest of its life doing next to nothing. Um, unless we need one, you know, we can dynamically create the mutex. And it'd be great if it didn't leak and leave things behind like this mutex that gets left behind forever. Can we get this stuff down to one integer and get rid of all these barriers? Wouldn't that be lovely? And if it wasn't called lazy init, maybe it was called call once. And like I said before, I've, all this stuff for me comes from trying to do call once. And this is call once, and this is call once, and this is call once, and that's call once, and that's call once. That's my version. It's more complicated than the boost version because it doesn't, very subtly, the boost version, if it does the same thing, it doesn't create a mutex unless it has to, but the boost version, if you did create the mutex, it has to stay around for the rest of your program. Mine, which is like 20 times more complicated, gets rid of that mutex after you're done with it. And this is what lock-free programming ends up looking like. You put this many comments in your code because no one will understand why did I need this to be atomic? Why did I need this to be, you know, somewhere up here, there's a, you know, this must be an acquire barrier, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's the fast return. But this one's also uh, thread uh, exception safe, which is hard to do. So, don't write that code, just use locks. Um, last thing, because the whole point of this thing, if you haven't gathered, is to scare the heck out of you to not write this kind of code. <sighs> deck alpha, I think Michael mentioned this earlier, the deck alpha has this, you read P and, you know, it's a pointer, you want to read the address. This is two reads, right? This is read P and then read what it was pointing to. And the alpha processor essentially will reorder these two reads, which is just completely impossible. And, you know, I, I, it's like, does it do address prediction? It's like, I see P, I don't know what it is yet, but I'll just predict and I'll go read what it might be, just like, you know, the speculative execution. Does it, does it peek into the write queue and see that, you know, someone wrote P and, and I'll just pull it from there? Um, part of what it does is it's got like two caches for each processor, even cache lines and odd cache lines. Um, it has a, besides the read and write queues, it has a cache update queue when another thread says, hey, that pointer has been changed. I better let you know that it's been changed. It goes, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that later. I'll just stick that in a queue. Um, to a certain point, it's almost, its idea of cache coherency is really kind of loose. But again, do I have my... my yeah, I have my locks. I don't have my. Uh, so I, I sorry. So I didn't get the memory order consumed. So that's sort of what the problem is. It's trying to solve is the dependent space ordering. Yes. Yeah. So the, in in C plus plus, the next C plus plus, there is a memory order flag for this condition. Ninety nine billion times out of whatever billion, um, you it, you'll never have to worry about this because there's like the alpha processor which no one uses is the only thing that ever did this, and we we do this. <laughs> oh, that's so scary. So that's, you know, the whole point of this talk was to scare you. Probably more processes will do this in the future, right? Um, yikes. Use locks. Um, that's maybe a good place to stop because, yeah, from then on it's uh, lock-free structures, which would be really interesting to get to, but if you guys want to eat... Um, the only other thing I wanted to say was, let me think, I have a conclusion page way down there somewhere. Uh, the only thing is, the only other quote is, instead of FUD, F-U-D, FUD, I have F-C-D, fear, certainty, and doubt. <laughs> That's kind of the point here, is that you should be afraid of this stuff. It's scary, and it's very certain that it's scary, and hopefully I've seeded some doubt into you. And I guess that's it. Yeah, questions?